We are live, so that means I need to start the show. And make sure I share audio. And here we go. In a world of divisiveness, we bring you diversity. In a world of hate, we bring you love. In a world of fear, we inspire you to live. And now, laughing, loving, and alive with your hosts, Rain Thomas, Elmer J. Howard, and Dr. Kevin. Hello, hello. I am Steven Spielberg. Oh. I am Elsie Hickam. Hmm. I think I want to be Jaws. Well, you do have the you know the the white and the gray thing going on today, so. Hey. Uh, okay. You know. I even sat down for this show. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, as Jaws or as Dr. Kevin, or I'm not following. Well, Jaws is always, you know, kind of at waterline. You know, so I, I, I sat down for the show. Actually, I love it. You, actually, as you guys know, we're taping a new introduction. And as Elmer's been trying to put it together... Great shot of you, great shot of him. I'm usually standing up, bopping around. You're looking up my nose. I'm like this. And so all of the pictures of me look horrible. So I said, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to light it. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to look at the camera. I'm going to give him a picture that I can actually go. You can use this picture. Elmer. Well, so I, I got I got Rain and I smiling and laughing, which you just did, so that could work. I just want to make sure you yeah, smile and laugh at the camera so I can use that clip. <laughs> for it and uh we have a couple of comments already we have uh brent who's hey, he's batman, batman. <laughs> hey, Andy. And andy says hi ah. so dr kevin how has the last couple of weeks been for you oh my god what has the last week, couple of weeks been for me uh busy crazy um I actually was excited. I spent all day today digging into a new mastery class I started teaching in September, uh, self-mastery through astrology. So I've got eight students, and I've been tearing apart their charts, and I've been tearing apart the information. And so it's going to be uh, – it, it's the part one is 54 hours that's going to happen over six months of training. Wow. To, because – when I do any of the classes at this point, I always do like self mastery classes. So like my, so I said part one for the astrology and it depends on how far the, the students want to go. But we did, when I did the Tarot course, uh, we did 22 nine hour days. I mean, you know, they were spaced out, but to really go in and have a deep dive. And I think that one of my frustrations in, in the time we live in is everybody wants things fast food. Everybody wants things quick. Mm -hmm. They want to just know the top little layer of it, and they don't want to dive into it. They don't want to really get right. the meat. And they miss so much of the opportunity for growth and to really understand it. But it's like, I'd like to, I, I want my students to have more than a engaging line at a social party over a cocktail because they took an astrology class. Oh my! Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. There's more than a sun sign, right? Uh so yeah. So these students better be ready to work hard because we're going to dig in, and I teach it through their charts, so they get to get it and apply it and see how it works and see what it means in their chart, and then they can move it to other people. So, um, my big excitement, besides preparing for the hurricane that wasn't, at least where we live. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, so that's really been my focus is, is I'm moving in this love teaching, always one of my passions. So rain before rain says, uh, starts, I just want to bring up 
that and it, Hi, Anita. Anita says hello. Happy birthday hello. again. I love you. <laughs> hello, Anita. Whoever you are. So it is New York so City. Rain, before you tell us about your last New couple York of weeks, City girl. is <laughs> is this uh, name tag that you've chosen for yourself, the Rocket Boys? The, well, I'm officially a Rocket Girl, so... So that's a Rocket Girl. Yes, yes, it's a Rocket Girl. And how has the last couple of weeks been for you? Um, phenomenal. Um, there's stuff I can't talk about. There's a couple of things I kind of can talk about. But I scored a skincare commercial. So that's been going on. It's a, an 11-day shoot, which we've been doing. And um, I scored. They, they're actually promoting and I want to put pictures up before. But um, so much fun to be in. It's I, You know, I'm not even going to tell. I'm just going to put it up. Because I know once I tell everybody, he's going to say, where are we going to see it? Where are we going to get it? But let's just do a little poking around Netflix. Let's just say that. <laughs> nice. How about okay. you, Omar? Knock it off, Dr. Kevin. Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for Albert to respond. I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm staying away from poking at Netflix, okay? Go dun, ahead. Dun, 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 Is this one of those Netflix and chill movies? <laughs> um, no, it's actually an international movie, which is what makes it so much more amazing to me. The, uh, the lead, she is a phenomenal woman, and she flew here from Africa to shoot it. And I actually play um, opposite her, like her best friend. And she's just lovely. Everything about her is lovely and regal and spiritual. And she's, you know, she's been in a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. When I put her name up and people look her up, they'll, they'll see her. And a lot of my friends from Nigeria were like, oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, you're with her. Me neither. And I'm really excited. So, and the Rain, other thing, a- yes. I have a question for you. Um, I, now, do you think that this director will actually let your line stay yes. in? Are they going to actually, you know, or or are you just going to be kind of, oh, and this is the best friend and then everything else will be cut? Yeah, I know. I've been there before. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually play her attorney. So without being... Without my lines, I'm not sure it would make a whole lot of sense in a couple of episodes. So yeah, this yeah. is yeah. And this, so, is, and this is a movie. Other, I, movie? I'll put it up. You'll see it. You'll okay. see it. I'll just put it up. And the other thing that is, I think, is fun. I am getting ready to do some more keynote stuff, and it might be via Zoom. But I realize it's going to be called a good uvula. Is hard to find until you know where to look. <laughs> Um, the crowd goes you, wild. <laughs> yeah, you you, you I, had Dr. Kevin you know, speechless. Pass. I think no. I'm. I was bringing up the image. <laughs> I was searching. I was searching my 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 data bank in the back of my head, and I think I decided I'm just gonna pass. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun clips of inspiring people through wellness and being the best they can be. So it'll loop back to us, too. So it it should be a good time because I, when I start talking to people again, I want to be able to loop them to laughing, loving, and alive. So thank you, Anita. What about you, Elmer? Awards of $40 million? Uh, It's not been a great couple of weeks. It's just been some oh. legal battles around IP and stuff, so. It ha- oh, as sometimes God. happens, I've learned my lessons, and yeah, actually, Doctor Kevin, I had a bone to pick with you until I realized that there was a, there was something um, that came out of it that was positive, and I was like, okay, maybe that was it. But I had asked you for a psychic hit on a project, and you had told me to go back into it, and it ended disastrously, <laughs> worse than before, <laughs> <laughs> and and I was thinking, you know, damn it, Kevin, why did you tell me to go back into this thing? Um, but well, you know what I got out of it um, was a couple things. Matt and I are going to actually are actually working on a Star Trek short film, 
uh, fan oh, film fun. now, and uh, and I might still do something up with the one that fell apart. I just got to give it a year or so, um, t- you know, for the other person to f- fail horribly. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and 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 I, I'm working on another project with a friend, and I didn't get a contract signed up front with that, and so now we're in a copyright battle over that. And I was like, okay, I've learned my lesson. Like I am, uh, you know, friend or not you're signing a waiver you're signing you know i'm getting i'm getting the rights i need to make the films because i can't make the films without the rights so it's you know lesson learned yeah so it's business always business yeah that's yeah a lot of people forget that you know it's show business and a lot of people are thinking about yeah. all the show I was like, oh, no, there's a whole lot of business yeah. behind that show yeah yeah it's not fun and, and, and you get tangled it's a mess and and remember the years when you worked with me in my spiritual business and how often did we have the conversation of it's still a business. It can be spiritual, but you, it's still a business. You still have to run it like a business. You know, I've been in business, you know, in a spiritual business for 31 years. And there's not a lot of people out there that last that long in a truly spiritually based active business, but it's because it was a business. And you and I had our problems along the way with people that weren't getting things signed or stuff like this. And so, yeah, the psychic hit was you should go forward. I, the psychic hit was never was going to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> I should have clarified that last time. Well, no, but you needed to learn something. You said at the end of the day, you, you realized something and it led to other conversations that could lead to things. And, you know, that's how spirit works. It's spirits. You know, I think one of the best images of spirit is a frog going from leap from you know leapfrogging from lily pad to lily pad. Um, you never know when, until you hit the next leap, until you take the next leap and hit the next lily pad, what you're going to see, what's going to be there. Maybe there'll be a wonderfully flat, just juicy fly for you to eat, or maybe it will just be a lotus for you to stop and digest that. Who knows? Or you can miss the lily pad and jump right into the shark's mouth. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so who's going to bring in our guest? Well, you need to bring in the guest. You need okay. to introduce and bring in the guest. Since you're the mother. Yes, since it's my, my this is my proud mom moment. Um Dr. Kevin, he's all yours after this. I know a lot about him. But um, my son, which I like to everybody, is from Colwood, West Virginia. And I know some West Virginians out there watching, and they're really proud. And when I went to West Virginia 10 years ago to, to visit cousins I didn't know, my life completely changed. The people of West Virginia, all these doors started opening. Scott Hill, who we had on it, on here uh, a few months back, completely that just, he took it and ran with it. And then the next thing I know, I was playing the mom of an icon and the world's biggest, if you dream it, you can do it guy. And I was like, Homer Hickam, this Homer Hickam, like the book I read, Homer Hickam, like, that Homer Hickam, like, yeah, playing his mom. So, ladies and gentlemen, this this young man needs no introduction, but it, because he's my son, he does. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you, Homer Hickam. Well, thank you, Mom. I, I was... <laughs> well, I tell you what, um, in the first place, I'm very relieved to hear you tell us about uh, the shows that you're on. And um, because when you mentioned Netflix, I was afraid that maybe you were going to be in the sequel of The Tiger King or something. Uh, (laughs) Hey, all work is good work. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's one of our guilty little secrets when, um, well, one of our guilty little secrets is that my wife Linda and I constantly worry about rain. So we're always checking on her. (laughs) So, and so, I you, love so her you, dearly. So you heard the horror story that, that I put her through, apparently. Um, well, no, no, no. I, about that and I don't think that I. Necessarily- I don't. I don't live it down. It's been two, three years now, and I still don't live it down. I mean, she made a little jab at the intro. You probably didn't get it unless you've been hearing the shows. But yeah, she, she and Kevin jabbed it. You know, 
uh, when we were introing the show. Well, anyway, um, I guess there are probably um, <laughs> listeners or viewers out there are wondering um, how how it was that Rain got to be my mom, and uh, so I'm not. Um, um, perhaps Rain would, would rather tell that story because it's pretty obvious no. that no. my mom is quite a bit younger than her son. <laughs> um, well, I got. I mean, I've got a couple of questions, Homer, right off the bat. I want to know. I mean, we're all familiar with Rain as the the wronged movie star who directors just heartlessly cut her best scene out of the movie. We know her as the singer. <laughs> we know her as the prune lady. But I really want to know, what was it like growing up with Rain as your mother? <laughs> Well, it's um, one of those blessings that could be defined as a curse, I suppose. Um, <laughs> um, no, uh, it's delightful. Uh, Rain is, 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 of course, a beautiful person inside and out. And um, I, I have to tell you that I lived approximately, I think, 65 years without realizing that Rain was actually my mother. Um, and so uh, now looking back over the past, I realized that uh, what a great influence that she had on me, even when I didn't know. Her. So, uh, uh-huh. I mean, that's a spiritual thing, right, uh, Dr. Kevin? I mean, you know, so uh, she's always been there and I just didn't realize. It. So, See, it's, a, it, it's a very spiritual thing. <laughs> Clearly, I mean, she was your mother and she came back in a past life and she came back in this life to play your mother on stage. So that connection could be reformed and move forward, and you have both been served by it. And there's your spiritual wisdom for the day. Okay, show's over. You can cut us out. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you this part. This is the part where it was moving because Scott Hill is the one that got this rolling. You know, he somehow told Homer he thought I would be perfect as his mom, and Homer got on board and. Scott called because, you know, after meeting him, you know, he likes to build stuff up and you can hear set up in there so you can't say no. And so, you know, once I spoke with Homer and I said, you know, that's asking a lot. It's are playing a real person that you know. I said, let me let me think on it. Let me pray on it. So a couple of days went by and I was just kind of Googling Homer and I was like, well, you know, look up his mom. And then um, I said, God, if you think this is a good role for me, I need a sign. And up pops his mom and we have the same birthday. That's true. That is very and I, true. Yeah. yeah, same birthday. I said, okay, God, I need a different sign because that's <laughs> not clear enough. <laughs> and the next day, Linda, Homer's wife, and we're really good friends. I love her dearly as well. They call me to say, you know, um, Homer's mom had this pin that she wore all the time, this little bumblebee and this scarf that she loved. And we've decided to send it to you. It doesn't mean we want you to take the role. We just wanted you to know that we thought you'd like to have it. And I said, okay, God, I get it. I'll take the role. <laughs> there I was. Okay, right. so I've got a question here because we all know that Rain is the queen of bank. We know that <laughs> she gets on to the phone. She will talk to anybody to try to hit up for stuff for all of her breast cancer work. She is the mistress of setting up a conversation, knowing that you're getting set up for the slam dunk. Did she learn that from you, Homer? Or did you learn it from her? Because what you did to Rain was you rained Rain to get her to do that role. And I just want to know, is this just a genetic trait that the two of you share as mother and son? Homer, talk to me about this. Yeah. <laughs> I think we always had in mind that Rain uh, was somehow going to, uh, to play this part from the moment that uh, we met her, even before we met her, as we talked about before. Um, so uh, one thing is, I'm not quite sure that everybody listening to us have a clue to what we're talking about in terms of what play that we're talking about here. So if we could just unpeel that onion real quick. This is Rocket Boys the Musical. For, for those folks who have read Rocket Boys, you know they made a movie called October Sky based on, I hate, hate that title, by the way. 
But anyway, it's an anagram of Rocket Boy. You take the letters, move them around. Rocket Boy spells October Sabbath, that thing. Another story. But anyway, um, the wonderful um, Trayman's siblings up in um, New York uh, wrote a wonderful musical based on the book Rocket Boys. Rocket Boys, the musical, of which, of course, the main character is, is little Sonny Hickam, which I used to be, but also Homer Sr., my dad, and Elsie Hickam, my mom. And it's a, it's a wonderful play. It's a wonderful musical. And it just fit Rain so perfectly with her wide range of talent. Um, her, her, of course, her singing ability, but more than that, you, the, the heart that she brings into everything that she does. So the moment I met her, I just somehow kind of knew that one of these days, she's going to play that part of Elsie Hickam, and she's going to be wonderful. So, and she was. And she... Yes, that's that's actually how we met. Is um, I casted her for a role in a film, and uh, I was on with the um, person whose story it was. It was based also based on a true story. And as soon as we did our Zoom inter- uh, Zoom casting call with her, I told Stan, I was like, I was like, she's it. She's the one. I didn't even have to hear anybody else. But yeah, she's got that. Um, when she's right for a role, she she's right for a role, and you know it right off the bat. Yay! Yeah. This sounds like double setup. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Well, this, I love this it. Role, this role is very interesting, um, and like I said, Rain really carries the role, and uh, uh, she she can carry the play for that matter. But um, this is a this is a role. It's the the, the musical has uh, light moments. It's comical. You know, these boys are building a rocket, and they are going to blow themselves up and all that. But then we see it, it delves into much more than the movie does. It delves into the the parents of these of this kid and the struggle between um, uh, the father, the husband, and the wife. And so we get to see that struggle. And so it goes from being kind of light and it gets, there are some very, very deep parts to it. Um, and, and Rain just carries that off wonderfully. So, Dude, so I'm kind of honored. Of the oh. part. Okay, so I, 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 enough telling Rain how fabulous she is. This shows about you all. <laughs> so anyways, uh, right. we, we all know, we, we all know Rain is fabulous. Rain, you're fabulous, no, shut up. So Homer, uh, <laughs> your, your, your parents were at odds with your, your, what you wanted to do, your chosen career, and is that the crux of the, I've not seen Rocket Boys. Uh, I well, have to admit, exactly. I have not read your book. I've not read the not book. Ex- so. Not exactly. Let, let me tell you a story, just real, a real quick story about after Rocket Boys, the book was a big success, and in the movie October Sky, West Virginia decided to have a day for the Rocket Boys in Colwood, where we grew up, this mining town. And so the governor of the state, Cecil Underwood, comes down for this. I'm there. The other Rocket Boys are there. And we're all extolling the virtue of this little mining town where we grew up and what it was like growing up here. And before I could stop him, the governor handed my mother the microphone and said, would you like to say a few words, Mrs. Hickam? And she, she took the microphone. She looked around. She said, I hate this place. I have always hated this place, and now that I'm back, I'm reminded why. <laughs> We're struggling to get the microphone out of her. <laughs> that was the crux of it. She hated living in that little town. It wasn't good enough for her. And, <laughs> and eventually, I can she- see why. <laughs> I can see why you cast Rain now. <laughs> So yes, I mean she took up for her boy, her 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 younger son. Who I was the back. You got to realize they had a perfect son, my older brother Jim. Perfect in every way, big football star, made good grades, got all the girls, and for some reason they decided they needed an emergency backup boy, and that turned out to be me. <laughs> I was nothing but a disappointment to them the whole time, and it's like you know every time. I would mess up well with the rockets and everything. Didn't I tell you not to blow yourself up? You know, you're our backup boy. <laughs> Whatever it was worth. So anyway, <laughs> how now? You you laugh a lot about it now, but I can't imagine that it was easy for you as a child. Um, 
to feel like you're competing against something that you cannot beat because you're just not, you, you, you know, it's like saying, well, the fish is just not going to beat the monkey climbing the tree. You got to appreciate the fish for being a fish and it can swim like hell, but it ain't never going to climb a tree like a monkey. And, but it feels like your parents didn't have that bandwidth. Well, mom did. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just making, uh, just making a joke. But mom, absolutely, she liked me. We were really very simpatico, and and um, so I, I got my mom. It was my dad that I really couldn't get, and I couldn't get his attention in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And I longed for that. I, I longed for him to pay attention to me, to to think that I was, you know, at least that I was his son. And um, it took me a long time to. Uh, to figure figure him out, I have to, you know I'd like to say I got a million dollars worth of psychotherapy. I didn't even know I needed. <laughs> so, um, so I started to figure out what my relationship with him really was and what it really meant. And uh, I mean, I, you have to come to terms with that eventually. I mean, my dad uh, he was like you know, a lot of these guys that came out of World War II and, and depression. Um, they, the way they saw it was that uh, they, per, they put a roof over your head and got three squares a day and they had done their part and then it was kind of up to uh, the, the mother to look after the kids. And that's kind of the way that it happened back in the 1950s. So it wasn't that unusual, but it still didn't necessarily feel good uh, when all of his attention was for the, the older brother. It wasn't Jim's fault at all. It was it was very complicated, and uh, ultimately, I did figure it all out as I as I wrote that book. We try so, to bring all that out in the play and in, in Rock and Boys music. How now? I assume that your father has passed now. Yes. How would you have? Well, how would you rate your relationship with him at the end of his life? Uh, probably about five, and in, in between um, the. Uh, I, I mean. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and, and um, I never got a letter from him the whole time I was over there. But my mother told him he was that he told me that he was concerned. And then when I came back, he never asked me about any of that. And um, and then uh, over the years, you know, when I would go and try to really talk to him, um, it was very difficult. And again, it's like these 1950s guys. You're you're sitting there, and everything is nice, and you don't, you know, how how do you talk to your dad when when the, he you get the sense that uh, it's not that he doesn't care, it's maybe not as interested in, as you think he should be. So you end up talking, well, how did you drive from Huntsville to Myrtle Beach? So, oh, you shouldn't have gone that way. You should have gone through Rome, Georgia. You know, that's the kind of conversation he had. It was very top level, and we never got down into the, into the weeds that I personally would have preferred. And my mom kept telling me that um, probably my dad was a great reader loved to read things and, and he was very proud he 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 passed after my first book came out with a book called torpedo junction and he he said to my mom tell sonny i thought it was well researched and that's like i'll take that <laughs> well <laughs> <I'll> take that. <laughs> you know but at least he got to see that and uh so mom kept telling me i needed to write my dad a letter and tell him all this stuff and i just kept putting it off and putting it off until it was too late i never did and I regretted that, and uh, that's one of the reasons why um, I've, I've written this next book, Don't Blow Yourself Up, because it does include that relationship with Dad and then how I felt like when I wrote Rocket Boys, I was basically writing him a letter. Um, and, and, and he is really, he is the character, the indispensable character in that book. Um, the one that's always behind the scenes, he, always motivating this boy whether the boy knows it or not so yeah um uh, it was it was a complex relationship and i knew he loved me you know I, I never doubted that it's just very difficult for him to show that well now personality wise were you were you more in alignment with being like your mother i mean did you and your were you and your mother closer to being the same type of person yeah, I'm definitely, my mother's uh, family is, or the Lavenders, uh, the Lavenders, uh, they all came out of uh, somewhere in Appalachia, and, um, but um, uh, I'm very much a Lavender, you can see it, 
for those who know the hickams and the lavenders you can see it in my face i'm a lavender and i like to tell jokes and i can be funny when i have to be and uh you know, I like to have fun in life where the Hickams are pretty stern bunch, <laughs> you know. So, um, so I'm definitely fall, I fall over on my mom's side of the family. So you get your sense of humor and your joie de vivre from mama. I think so. Um, and, uh, you know, it's um, every, you know what, I can turn into my dad, though. It's kind of interesting. When I was over in Vietnam, I turned into my dad. Uh, I kept thinking, well, what would Dad do in this case? And it was generally the right thing. So uh, my wife, Linda, calls it, I, I'm becoming the captain. The, I was a captain in the Army. Uh, I'm really becoming my dad. So if you put a lot of pressure on me, all of a sudden, without realizing it, and you don't want to be there when that happens, I do turn into my dad. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you look back in, in your career and see with some of what you have accomplished and I mean you've you've accomplished a lot and uh, you, the, all of the different things that you've done can you see the points where being your dad was the thing that pushed it into success beyond just the Vietnam your, your experiences in Vietnam yeah well dad was very organized um, and um, Besides the, the the need to have a, a lot of imagination, which I put more over on my mom's side, in order to write and to write well, I think you have to be organized in your thoughts and the way, the way that you structure uh, the book. So I, I think it's my mom's imagination that allows me to write, um, but it's my dad's organizational ability that allows me to structure it so that it makes sense, so that you follow it and you want to turn the page. So, um, so I, I hopefully I got something from from both parents, and uh, and I'm glad that. Well, I mean, it sounds like you did get something from both parents. Now, how many books do you actually have out? And you say you've got another one coming. Is there a release date for that, or is it still in process? Uh, no, it comes out in October uh, of this year. It's um, this will be book number nineteen, I think. So. Um, Besides, uh, I, I, there's no question in my mind that I will forever be known for Rocket Boys, that they made the movie October Sky. I've come to terms with that. But I have a lot of uh, fans out there who I uh, love the, the Josh Thurlow series that I wrote that's set during World War II. Torpedo Junction, the first book I wrote, which was about the German U-boats up and down the East Coast during World War II. And, um, and a lot of other books, um, The Dinosaur Hunter. My big dinosaur hunter uh, myself, I go out every... Year we are not afraid. Uh, uh, rains holding up, which I wrote after 9/11, which which brought the wisdom of the people of Colwood, who should have been afraid every day. Their their men got up. They all went down into a deep, dark, dirty coal mine, and they might not return. Um, and the women had to watch them go and worry about them all day. It was a it was a perfect place or fear to take over, yet they were not afraid. They had a good life. And so in that book, I wrote about the, the wisdom that they had. They were proud of who they were. They stood up for what they believed. They kept their family together. They considered that holy, and they trusted in God, but they relied on themselves. So they, they had these things going for them, and I tried to pick that in that book, We Are Not Afraid, after 9-11, and, 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 and we put that out. Um, it was by the um, uh, by the publisher that did uh, uh, what was it? Uh, the Soup for the Soul, the, the books, mm -hmm. um, and um, so that was the idea. And and now that book is actually starting to get a little bit more popular again because right now we're in the midst of this pandemic, and there's a lot of reasons for that people have taken on fear to themselves, and they can't let go of it. Once they've got it, it's a very difficult thing to let go. Of. And so, uh, so hopefully, uh, some of that book and the stories that of these Colwood people, these mining, these mining town people, how they fought against not being fearful, and mainly they didn't want to transfer it to their children. And so that's what we have to be very careful about. We're, get, we're getting off perhaps the, the topic here, but that is what that that was what we are not afraid was about, and uh, I was very proud to uh, write that book. Um, Homer, uh, 
here's a little secret that you should know about laughing, loving, and alive. We don't have a topic. <laughs> oh, good. We, we, we don't have a script. We are the topic. We, <laughs> we have a free flowing conversation. This is how this is this is how I roll here and on my radio show. Um, is I want the listeners. My goal is always that people walk away and go, that person was really interesting not just in a pr release mode but somebody who i now want to check out i that's a valuable person to have a a an understanding of so i think everything you've been saying is helping achieve my goal and since it's all about achieving my goal you're doing a good job of course yeah i, uh, yeah. <laughs> I understand that entirely <laughs> so Tell me, you know, when you were talking about the coal miners and there, there were two thoughts that came to me. And one was one of the, is, is a scene out of one of my favorite Christmas movies, A Christmas Carol, the 1954 version with Alistair Sims. And it's when he discovers that the woman that broke up with him when he was young was now serving and it, and it was serving in like a Welch mining town. and. They were singing carols and they were finding joy, even though they had very little and, and stuff like this. And I, I, as you were talking about what the, the basis you wrote that book, that's kind of what came up to me was the fact of that w what I look at is you choose to have a good life with whatever life gives you. Do you feel that that was one of your themes and 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 how you approach the world? Well, I yeah, I think so, Dr. Kevin. There's no question about that. And that that was the kind of the I would have to say in Colwood, the overriding uh, purpose of our parents in Colwood was to make sure that their children had a good life, no matter what their life was. And that's something that I've just never forgotten. Uh, looking back on it, and and they they did so much to try to not allow us to be affected by the life that they were in. They did everything they possibly could, and um, that included encouraging us to read constantly. Um, they had my parents were members of about four different book of the month club, and and they would pass these adult books on to me and uh, to read, and so. Uh, all of our teachers and everything. It was like, um, after a certain point in time, everybody in that town, except for my dad, who was the mine superintendent, was sort of like the mayor of the town, um, was pretty sure that, that this town wasn't going to be around in, in a couple of decades because they were starting to run out of the easy coal to get. Um, and, uh, of course, the, the whole coal industry was going down. And so for generations, uh, uh, our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents had made a living in this town, but that was not going to be true for these kids. And so um, they were doing everything they possibly could to educate us and send us out into the world. And that was put into our head fairly early. You need, you need to not depend on this town. You need to get educated. You need to get out of here. Now, that's, that, and so hangs the tail with the Rocket Boys. My dad felt like, that life in a company town was a good life and that he was convinced that if they only did it his way, that Colwood could go on forever. And so, uh, although it was clear my perfect brother was not going to stay in Colwood, he started focusing on me in that case to ultimately take his place. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was that type of psychology that was going on in this little town at that time. And, uh, we didn't, I, we didn't, the children didn't really realize what was happening until we were gone, until we did get educated, and then we looked back and realized what our parents had done for us. And I think it's true of a lot of parents and a lot of kids. They don't realize what their parents are doing for them until they get away and then they look back, but they need to look back. And one of the, one of the more powerful influences on, on my life was that my parents talked about their parents and their grandparents and crazy Uncle Ken and everybody in the family. I listened to that. My brother usually took off, but they talked about that 
So I knew exactly who I was because I knew who my family was. And I think that's very important for children today. And I, when I go out and talk to parents, and um, I always tell them, even though their kids pretend not to care, they really, really do. They need to talk about who they were, how they met, how they got, you know, how their parents got together. Even if they're divorced, you know, at least give them that much and then tell them about their grandparents and their great grandparents and everybody else. So they realize who they are, where they fit in the great scheme of things. And that was that happened to me. I was very fortunate. Well, I think that there's been a big shift, actually, in parenting. The parents of the 50s oftentimes were about what they wanted for their children. And I think that the parents um, at some point started shifting to what do the children want for themselves? And that there was a generational kind of shift, which has also created that sometimes you, you end up with parents who end, who, uh, you know, the fifties parents, the sixties parent going into the early sixties parenting, they would often they say, well, I want my child to have a better life. I want my child to have a better life. But there's a lot of parents in the work. I mean, I've been in practice for 31 years working with people. And I've watched this shift happen. We have a lot of parents out there that don't want their kids to eclipse them. I can't. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I mean, I have to say that uh, the parents of the 50s, I mean, you can you can say, well, uh, that uh, they were too harsh or, or whatever it was, uh, and, and, and uh, like my dad and so on. But I have to say that, again, one of their strengths was that they kept the family together no matter what. I knew, I knew, I knew one boy growing up, one boy whose parents were divorced, only one. And that was a boy who came to visit his grandparents during the summer. Now, you know, up and down that valley, with all the stresses that are going on with these with these men going off to work in this deep, dark, dirty coal mine. And my parents, my mom hated this little town and resented that she had to be there because she wanted to. She wanted more for herself. Yeah, once she had children, they were they stuck together, and so they sacrificed for them. And, and we didn't even realize it. And, you know, I've been divorced, so I, I know how, you know, coming out into the great world here, um, how easy it is to, to let that happen. But, but I, you know, my hat has to go off to these parents who were willing to sacrifice their life, stick together for the kids, which a lot of times we say, oh, you shouldn't do that. I don't know about that. Uh, that, to me, seems like an obligation that once you have them to take on and I'm, I'm sure I'm stepping on a lot of toes here saying that I don't have kids so I can get away with it uh, we're raising cats instead of kids but nonetheless I just that's one of the lessons that, that came out of, of Colwood for me. I think it's so I want to ask about Colwood uh, and where it's at today um, but before I do that I do want to uh, address something I think it depends on the family whether it's in the best interest to stay together because i think what what we need to look at and recognize is if you have two or three kids watching their dad coming home drunk every night and beating their mother you really want them to stay together for the kids no, no. And, and i understand that i get that i totally get that yeah uh, so, so you know it just didn't there was a we didn't have that type of extreme case that I know of, okay? But that yeah. kind of thing was, was occurring. It might have been. I don't know. Uh, I just oh, didn't the, see. Yeah, the 50s were, were noted for their illusion. They were also noted, and I wondered this about your father when he talked about it, uh, was that a lot of boys came home different from World War II than they went in. They were less prepared... Uh, the uh, World War One and World War Two were just really less prepared, and um, to to leave the farm and to go into 
um, the war and the magnitude of what they saw and experienced, and then had little to no support from a psychological standpoint of how to deal with those horrors. And it changed a lot of him and it shut him down and it made him broken. And your father found a purpose being the mining supervisor and the mayor of Colwood and bringing his boys up. I mean, like he found a purpose to focus on, but I wonder if he would have been able to be more emotionally available, not just as a product of the generation, if he had not gone to through a war. I don't know if that's ever occurred well, to you, but that's what I wondered. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, the coal mines were a form of war every day, you know. So it was like you were going to the front line, you had to keep your men safe. So he had that kind of uh, psychological ability to, to handle that, uh, mm -hmm. at least as far as we could tell. But the thing about the, the uh, uh, COVID was a perfect, was a, was a company town. And then mm -hmm. and at, the, at that time in the United States, there were a lot of company towns. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the, the company owned everything. It owned every house, it owned every street, it owned every fence, it owned every store, it even owned the church. Uh, so even the preacher was a company man. Everybody was a company man. So, um, so, so it was compact, it was a unit. And so it, that it could be controlled. In other words, if there was a father who was not looking after his child, the other fathers took care of that father, okay? They got him squared away. So in that way, it was a benevolent dictatorship, if you will, but it was just this solid little unit. So that was that was better for these guys coming back from World War II and the Depression. They had they were they knew who they were. They were proud of who they were. So, but a lot of these veterans came back, just like my era, the Vietnam veterans. They come back to a community that's just all spread out. It's kind of shattered in a way, and then they have to deal with all of that. And they don't have that immediate support that you would have in a little company town like Colwood. And that's where my dad, that's why my dad felt like that, that, that uh, Colwood should continue because he saw that. And that was his strength. That was his, that was his, that was his purpose. So where's Colwood today? Well, Is Colwood. Is it still a mining uh, town? Is it still in existence? Did it continue? Well, the mine shut down many, many years ago. It uh, shut down in uh, the 70s. Um, little, what they call truck mines have come back. But for the most part, the people that live there now are just, there were 2,000 people lived in Colwood when I grew up there. And now there's maybe 300 people that live in Colwood. So a lot of the houses, um, the old company houses, they're just falling down everywhere. Of course, um, they have a lot of problems. It's in MacDowell County, uh, Southernmost County in West Virginia uh, used to have um, almost 200,000 people in it. It's got maybe 15,000 now. So it's just, it has so totally changed. And uh, so it's it's not the place where I grew up. So I lost the place where I grew up. Um, and again, so when I look back at it, I can look at it back nostalgically when I write about it. But um, it was also, it's a place that doesn't exist anymore. So I get to bring it back to life when I write about it, which, is, which to me is a, a very interesting exercise. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I, I also write, and I have books out, and I have some books that are in localities that have changed so much that you wouldn't recognize it from the way I'm describing it. But um, so my 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 ne so my next actually comment and then question for you is. Have you ever wondered if that always wanted to hear about crazy Uncle Ken and always wanted to hear about all of these people, that that was just the early writer in you coming in to learn about characters and character development? Because I often find, and same for me, uh, uh, you know, I, I was one of three boys, I was the baby, that I was always fascinated by all the crazy characters in the family and I wanted to know everything about all of them. <laughs> and I know that parts of them have showed up in the things that I've written. Yeah. Do you think the same is true yeah, for you? Yeah. And one of the things, I've, I've taught a few writing classes, and what I like to bring out to these young writers, they're always, people are always bringing me plots. Oh, Homer, you should write this plot. You know, there's just this thing on the space station that's happening or the moon or whatever. It's like, so what? 
What people are really interested in is other people. You have got to write about characters that people care about. And then you can put them in any kind of plot. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> You're going to want to turn a page to see what happened to that uh, that person. So, yeah, that's the trick. And I've always been very interested in that and uh, peeling back a character. And I don't necessarily use everything that I know about that character. Hemingway said that the, if you know if you know something, your reader will know it whether you write it down or not. And I've always, I, that's one thing I can agree with Ernie, Ernie Hem- Hemingway. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I'm not in for killing bulls, okay? So, uh, fine, bulls are good, for, but <laughs> everything else is good. Uh, he was absolutely right about uh, about character. As a matter of fact, um, in the, in the book, uh, one of them Rain held up uh, carrying Albert home. My uh, I write about. Uh, see, my parents were always telling me stories about when they before my brother and I were born about this alligator that was given to my mom by her former boyfriend called, uh, his name was Buddy Epson. Remember Buddy Epson? Played uh, oh, yeah. uh, Uncle Jed in yeah. uh, Beverly Hills. Well, my mom and and Buddy Epson were boyfriend, girlfriend, because my mom ran away from the coal fields and lived in Florida for a while. <laughs> anyway, so when, he, when she came back and married my dad, Buddy Epson sent her an alligator. And uh, as a wedding present, <laughs> and so th- that whole book is about, uh, and it was, uh, it was kind of, it was uh, uh, a, uh, a story that it was like is a family story, it was a family legend that just kind of grew and grew and grew and grew. <laughs> so it was a fun book to write. But one of them, one of the characters that they met along the way was Ernest Hemingway down in Key West. Actually, they were going to Orlando from West Virginia, and they ended up down in Key West. Geography was not their strong suit. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so but that that book is an example of just character after character after character. And as a writer, <clears throat> you have to be sometimes a little bit courageous if you use a real person um, to tell the story that that you think that person could have done. And and somebody like John Steinbeck and Ernest Hemingway was great. They're both in the book. I gave, I put them right in there. I put words in their mouth, and I didn't even hesitate to do it because they are interesting characters, and I've read enough about them that I think I know what they would say in a certain situation. So you know, uh, uh, writing a book, um, I, I, I read, I, I hear so much from other other writers or some writers who go on and on about how awful it is to write you sit there at your keyboard you open up the vein and just bleed all over it and it's like that's not for me i love to write I, that to me is just the greatest thing in the world i can sit here at my keyboard and just write right 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 and you know what uh dr kevin when i feel like i'm really in the groove and i'm really writing something that's wonderful in the back of my mind a little voice is saying you do realize you're going to throw this away, don't you? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just too much. <laughs> Get out hey, of um, <laughs> I, I, I identify with that comment more than you know. Uh, um, who, who are some of the best storytellers outside of you, of course? Who are some of the best storytellers that maybe you think people should go check out that maybe are not as famous or is not as well known, but you think that they know how to knock it out of a park when they write characters, write a book? Uh, I would say the, the fellow that wrote True Grid, I think his name is Charles Portis. He's a good one to go to. He's wrote, he wrote about four books before he passed away. Uh, those books I occasionally go to and just reread because... Uh, there's there's so much uh, his method of telling the story. It's usually in first person. I generally write in third, but every once in a while I write in first person. But anyway, he he just reaches out and grabs you and brings you into it. Another writer I'd say that perhaps not that well known is uh, Rick Bragg, uh, who wrote all over but the shout. And he writes a little uh, car, uh, article in uh, Southern Living every month. Um, his uh, the metaphors that he's able to come up with are just astonishing. As a matter of fact, uh, Rick uh, is a professor at the University of Alabama, um, and um, he wrote for the New York Times for a while. Got a Pulitzer 
um, but um, but uh, who cares? He, he's a professor at University of Alabama, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, so Rick nominated me to be Alabama's Writer of the Year one year, and uh, and uh, which was wonderful. And I came down to Tuscaloosa uh, on campus and talked to all the journalism students. You know, the English students and so on, and then they had me say a few words and wanted me to read from one of my books. And instead, without telling Rick or anybody else, I read from Rick. Read from one of Rick's books. I didn't say I didn't say that it was not my right. <laughs> I just read. And then I said at the end of it, I could have written that. I really could have. I just never would have thought of. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have a. Give, you know, if the writer really grabs me like he does, I, I like to get back. I, I have a question for you. So, you know, we know from the Rocket Boys and people who didn't read that, the October Sky movie, that, you know, you had a passion for the science, specifically rocket science. And now you've been writing um, for, the, you know, for this this next stage of your life. So do, would you say you have two passions that you like both of them equally well? Or did you really, is like writing more of a passion for you? Well, I like to say that I wanted to be an engineer, but I had to be a writer. Uh, so that that's kind of the, the, where that happened. Uh, if it hadn't been for Sputnik and all that excitement, I probably would have ended up being an English professor at some Midwestern university. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, but instead <laughs> I became an engineer. I had to really work hard. I went to one of the toughest engineering schools in the country at Virginia Tech, and um, they did everything they could to flunk me out. Uh, but I, I hung in there. That's one of the things I write about, and, and don't blow yourself up, is, is being, it was a military college at that time, so mm-hmm. it was a very interesting thing, and then Vietnam happened. But then, uh, of course, what most people think of me is working for NASA, and I had a wonderful career with NASA, but in the process of working for NASA, you can't imagine how many characters that I've met <laughs> that have just been grist for my, including a bunch of the astronauts, the a good portion of them tried to get me fired most of the time, and uh, so <laughs> all, of the, all of the, I trained them. I trained the astronauts. They're kind of resentful about that sometimes. You know? So, um, so again, I was just I was collecting all of this all this information I probably wouldn't have been able to to get if I had been an English professor. You know, maybe I could have, but nonetheless, because I had this career, uh, I ended up. Uh, doing the Vietnam thing and then working for the Army Missile Command and then NASA for all those years. It just kind of set me up at the end of that to make my career as a writer because I had all of these characters to write about. And so now finally I'm, I'm getting uh, my agent, Frank Wyman, kept pressing me, you know, Homer, people really want another memoir from you. And it's like, I'm waiting for more people to die, Frank. You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I, I understand that one, too. Uh, but I had to anyway, so uh, hopefully they won't they won't be too mad. <laughs> what would what? you say? Why did you not like October Sky as a title? You said well, you've come to learn to live with it, but what was your what was your beef with it? Well, uh, that it wasn't the title of the book. I mean, if if you are, I mean, what are the odds of getting a book? that you wrote made into a movie it's there there's just not enough zeros behind it to one because it just doesn't have many books are as i like to tell a lot of authors get real excited you know when their book get option many books are optioned but very very few are made um and so that was like oh man i won the lottery here um and then uh, and they made the the movie as rocket boys and then at the end of it oh we're going to change the title and it's like oh my god don't do that because the rest of my life and this has happened, I'm going to have to say, I'm the author of Rocket Boys, you know, October Sky. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that was my beat. Otherwise, that was a fine title. If I'd named the book that to begin with, okay, we all been great. So that was really my problem. <laughs> okay, I was right. just I, curious. I, I'm going to have to cut Dr. Kevin off because I know Elmer's going to. Oh, would you come back again to see us? Because we're down to like 45 seconds. One minute, seconds. yeah. And we have people that are sending me messages on Instagram and they're like, "Um, how do we see the movie? And I'm like, just Google it because it comes right up. It's on Amazon Prime, I think. 
Yeah, and I got your books in other languages. I'm like, I don't care what this is. I'm glad my son is writing all of this good stuff. Um, <laughs> sure, I'd be happy. I, uh, this has been a lot of fun for me, really. So, yeah, let's do it again. And, oh, on excellent. Our, on our next show, we have Connie, is it Fife Rain? Is that how you pronounce yes. her last name? Yes, yes, you're going to love her. She is a marketing guru, and I met her in the airport about 10 years ago, and we became friends, and she knows a lot of people, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I will uh, play us out if I can get us into Don't this. hang up, homie. Yeah, no. hold on. <laughs> Well, I've got I've got your favorite. Uh, if I can find it, I've got your favorite. Uh, rain. Next time we Next bring Scott, Scott, Hill, Scott Hill, on here, Hill on here, we'll, we'll let him play, him play the ukulele. I've seen him in a grass skirt. skirt. <laughs>